Okay, so I hope you see the full screen. Yeah. Yeah, looks pretty good. So our next speaker is uh, Maxim Yurkin, and the title of his talk is The DDA, the Discrete Dipole Approximation from Maxwell's Equations to Practical Applications. Please go ahead, Maxim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, so, I, well, here's a plan. We will be talking about the basics of light scattering and DDA, then a few details about the DDA, then I will show you some nice applications with a lot of beautiful pictures. And uh, then I will talk a little bit about existing computer codes and simulation accuracy that you should mind at least a little. And a few recent development, which are particles on substrate and way of blade to prolate particle. And I finish probably with the most interesting part is open questions for further development. So we're talking about the light scattering or general interaction of electromagnetic fields um, with particles. And commonly, we consider on elastic uh, scattering. And uh, the physical uh, origin of the DDA comes from well, very simple concept that uh, if you have a point dipole uh, in well in frequency domain, you know everything about uh, the field. So some formulas are shown here, but basically this is the main free space green tensor, which is like the most complicated function in the DDA, and it's still you see not complicated at all. Uh, so you have one dipole, you know how it interacts with the incident field. And then if you consider uh, several dipoles or a lot of dipoles, then basically each dipole senses a field which is incident field plus the field of all other dipoles. And if you multiply it by plausibility, which in the picture of point dipole is just some phenological constant, then you know the dipole moment. So basically, if you look at this, uh, you see a system of equations for known uh, dipole polarization, PI, and that's basically it. So then you just do some hand waving, like uh, considering any particle of any shape, we just divide it into uh, point dipoles or small elements which were approximate approximate as a point dipoles. And that seems uh, way um, intuitively obvious because it's uh, similar to a homogeneous medium composed of individual at atoms. So, well, that's all kind of natural and easy and that's how it originated in, in the astrophysical community. Uh, you see the references here. Uh, but the problem with it that uh, since it's not really derived, but kind of you have a phenomenological derivation, uh, when it works, it's fine, but if you want to improve it or to kind of estimate the potential errors, you can't really do it with such an approach. Uh, the nice thing is that actually the same DDA, the same equations can be derived very rigorously. So you just take a differential Maxwell equation, then an equivalent form of integral Maxwell equations, which is shown here for non-magnetic materials. There are some issues with singularity, et cetera, but it's all, for example, a recent paper where it's all discussed in details. And then you just take this equation, do volume discretization, so which means that you consider any particle, well, here it's a simple sphere, but you can take uh, any shape, divide it into cubes. And then uh, for each cube, uh, you basically approximate the field as constant inside. And any cube, you have this uh, chi here, which is a, uh, uh, this function based on effective index. So it, the effective index can vary as much as you want from voxel to voxel or from dipole to dipole as we call them traditional lit method. So importantly, you have this volume discretization, you arrive at the same equations. Uh, there are some different ways how you can define these two uh, quantities here, G and M, but, but I won't talk about it in details. And once you solve these linear equations, uh, you get uh, dipole polarizations or internal fields, and then you can compute easily anything you want. So basically, you can get near fields, far fields. Uh, you can get some integral quantities, which you are used to, I don't know, backscattering, cross-section, whatever you want. So that's all easy to compute. And that usually takes a minor fraction of the computational time once you know the internal fields. And important conclusion of this kind of rigorous derivation from Maxwell equations is that DDA is numerically exact in the sense that if you take uh, enough computer power, you can get uh, any accuracy you want. The practical feasibility, it's not guaranteed, of course, because I mean, we are always limited in computer power, but at least it's not an approximate method like geometrical optics or something like that. 
Uh, another important kind of generalization that, well, we're mostly interested in light scattering, I think, in this community, but uh, actually you can have many different incident fields, not just plane waves. First, you can take various beams, uh, like uh, best cell beams, which Stefania Gluchow was talking yesterday about, or any other complex beams, and you can compute near field enhancement. So that's kind of one generalization. Another, you can replace this plane wave by emitting dipole. So you just place a dipole somewhere near particle and take incident field as the field of this point dipole. And then you can compute fluorescence or Raman scattering enhancement by a nanoparticle. Uh, so Stefan D'Agostino, I think, pioneered it uh, several years ago. Uh, then you can go further and put a thermal emitting dipole. So that's kind of, again, point dipole, but it's uh, uh, fluctuating. So it has some random value and it's placed inside the particle. And based on this, you can compute near field radiative transfer. It's a hot topic already. And there are specialized codes like TDDA by uh, Shayla Dalatpo and our chairman today. Uh, who can do these calculations. Then further, even not fields, etc., et but produced by electrons. So if you have a field of a passing electron, you can compute electron energy loss, spectroscopy, cathode luminescence. And well, uh, again, there are specialized codes for that, uh, which are DDLs and EDDA, but for implementation in ADA, there was a talk on Monday by Alexander Kichi. So importantly that all this is, I mean, we go from one physical phenomena to another, but it's all boils down to change in the right hand side in the equation that you solve for the DDA. So that's really easy. I mean, it does not really change the computational core of the method. Uh, well, I showed you that DDA is easy, but actually there are many different options of, as I said, how to compute this G and M, uh, M terms, and M is related to polarizability, and actually many terms for that, but they're usually not important. And by contrast, these terms like FCD and IGT, which is filtered coupled dipoles and integration of gain standard, they can make a lot of difference in some uh, cases, but I won't have time to talk about it in details. Uh, let me mention computational issues. So I showed you a system of, of uh, linear equations. It can be huge, up to a billion. And the problem is that this matrix is dense because every dipole interacts with every other dipole. So if you look at it, you can say, okay, that's not possible at all, such a huge uh, dense system. However, we have a blessing here, which is a regular rectangular grid, and then a translation symmetry of the green stanza, which uh, results in the matrix, which is multi-level block toplets, well, which is a bit complicated structure, but a simple toplets uh, matrix matrix look like that. So it has the same number on diagonals. And the main thing that using this symmetry, this structure of the matrix, you can do a matrix vector product uh, using FFT-based FFT convolution in basically linear time in N, as shown here. And then if you combine it with iterative solvers and you assume that number of iteration that it's needed will be quite small, then uh, you arrive at computational complexity of the whole method, which is not like n squared or n cubed, which would be impossible for this number, but almost linear in, in number of n. And that's the only thing that makes uh, DDA uh, suitable for such large uh, well, num number of diapers. However, this blessing is also a curse because many potential development that you can easily think of for such a method, they will break this regular grid. And that's why, well, at least some of them here, they're usually not possible with the DDA, or at least they're much more complicated than you would think from the beginning. Well, still some optimizations are possible. There will be a talk later in this session about that. So if we talk about applications further, well, I mean, you just name it any any field like astro from astrophysics to nanophotonics, anything uh, can and was already probably simulated with the DDA. So I even maintain a kind of a Hall of Fame for largest simulations. Uh, the record in this Hall of Fame in terms of the particle size uh, for like 10 years is still this uh, huge sphere, which is 100 wavelengths in diameter. There is a cheat here, uh, although you see this effective index is kind of small. If you increase it to 1.2, that would be impossible. 1.1, maybe you can do it, but with a much larger computational time. So, but you see a uh, so large particle and uh, the MIS theory is reproduced uh, very well. 
Uh, then, as I promised you some beautiful pictures, uh, surely DDA is used for all kinds of particles, but I will mostly show the most complex ones because that's where you definitely need volume integral equation, volume discretization method at least. It can be DDA or FDTD or anything else. And for biological particles, actually, the DDA is usually the most computationally efficient method because the effective index is close to that of the host medium. So here are a few examples here. Uh, then if you go to complex atmospheric aerosols, uh, again, uh, when you have some inhomogeneous particle like melting snowflakes, uh, some coating on top of soot aggregates, then DDA is a method of choice for many researchers, and here you see the examples. Uh, also, there have been some efforts to simulate effectively infinite inhomogeneous objects like discrete random medium, you can call it. Uh, surely we always... Um, uh, simulate a finite system. But if your finite system can be rather large, then you see that uh, you can actually approach more or less the infinite session. I think the latest example is Ante Pintilla was talking uh, on Monday about the simulations and uh, at, at that paper we managed to do, well, at least single simulation for a million of wavelength sized spheres, which is, well, kind of huge. Uh, then also for metallic nanoparticles, I should admit that DDA has some issues in terms of convergence and accuracy, but still people use it a lot, especially for some complicated systems as shown here, like made of two metals or from two particles. Uh, or here you see some metal nanoparticles on top of some larger structure like hedgehog like. Um, uh, as soon as you, the more complicated geometry you have, the more you are inclined to use DDA because, well, it's uh, rather simple to put any shape into it. And that's, well, just another example. You can call it like a multi-scale system. Uh, you can even go to some uh, more complicated, like anisotropic and inhomogeneous particles. So, uh, for example, here you have uh, dielectric, anisotropic dielectric constant with changes with particle radius. So here the DDA was used for a reference. And here another example where both uh, tensorial epsilon and mu were used, but for that uh, you need a custom built code because most of the DDA research is focused on non-magnetic materials. Uh, also, DDA have been used not only for single simulations, but for building huge databases. We saw many databases at these conferences, but these are just a few examples where DDA was used extens extensively. So that's for biological particles and also for non-spherical aerosol particles. But well, for the latter, I should say that now there are many more different methods. Um, I won't say which is definitely better but the variety is a lot for biological particles. As I mentioned, I think DDA is more or less exclusively used for really complicated particles. Um, so here we go to open source codes because that's something you need to really try the method because otherwise you see nice uh, formula, some nice examples, but to actually do something yourself, you want a code to download and try. And the DDA is exactly, uh, uh, the right choice for that because the DDSCAT is actually one of the first, I would say, open source codes, I mean, kind of with a nice user manual, etc., that appeared. And I think it was an example for many more codes, not, not only DDA ones in, in the community. And at the well, I will do a bit advertising of it because I'm developing it. Uh, well, it has some pros and cons compared to DDSCAT, but here are a few better functions which uh, you can already try, so if you're interested in any of these, uh, give it a try. We even have a graphical user interface, again, in uh, development phase. And here is actually a list of, uh, more or less, uh, modern list of all related codes, much more than mentioned here. A few words about the accuracy of simulation. So overall, the DDA is a reliable numerically exact method. You can use it as a black box and the codes kind of allow it. So you just download the code, run it and get some result. But I encourage you not to do it. At least do some testing, especially if you're doing not a single simulation, but like a series of simulations. And when you do this test to compare with some reference method, um, also consider that uh, spheres are usually special. So if you do some uh, test on spheres and then apply the code to some other shape, even spheroids or even, or especially some inhomogeneous uh, 
the regular particles, then the conclusions about the accuracy can are not necessarily transferable. So it, it's nice to have at least a few tests on comparable shapes. And actually for that, you can even use uh, the DD itself. So if you just vary discretization or try different formulations and see how the result changes, it will give you some feeling. And finally, I also advise you to use Richardson type extrapolation, uh, which is very simple as I show here. The idea is, and you can use it actually for any method, but uh, with method of low order basis function, which is uh, DDA is, it works uh, better than for more complicated method. So the idea is that you just take, fix the scattering problem. So the size, shape, or effective index, et cetera, and then vary the discretization parameter or size of the dipole, which means you will have different number of, uh, of dipoles. And then you compute your any quantity of interest here, the extinction efficiency is shown, but you can do the same graph for any uh, quantity that you compute and you just plot it versus this discretization parameter. So look at the red dots, for example. You compute it only to this. You can't go further because it will be too computationally expensive, but then you just plot a quadratic line here. It's almost linear through it, and then you get the result, which is much more accurate, and you get this result almost for free. So the details are shown here and also well in a few more recent papers, uh, but that's a kind of a very simple choice uh, how to improve the accuracy and importantly not only to improve but also get some estimate of the error you see here by this error bars. So uh, talking about uh, recent developments one of them is scatter near substrate. Uh, basically the idea is that we don't want to discretize the whole system around here but only discretize the uh, particle itself as we do in the um, uh, in homogeneous medium or in vacuum. And this can be done, but before it was done with some loss of computational efficiency because uh, 3D FFT was replaced by 2D FFT because the translation symmetry of the green stanza, which now should account for the substrate, it's kind of broken by this uh, in, in Z direction. However, uh, this was fixed uh, by me and Markus Hunterman uh, about five years ago. So now we have an implementation which works almost uh, with the same speed as free space DDA and you can rigorously account for any substrate, well, any homogeneous uh, semi-infinite uh, substrate. And here's just a small comparison with the reference thematics uh, code for a simple system. And you can see that you can easily get accuracy again using extrapolation uh, well below 1%, like fraction of percent. Uh, so the next is rectangular cuboid dipoles. The idea is again very simple. So we divide our particle into cubes. Why don't we divide it into rectangular cuboid uh, elements? Kind of obvious thing to, to do. And uh, if you look at the literature, there were actually two like uh, schools of thoughts you can or direction of thoughts to how to do it. One is you keep this point dipole interaction, but just uh, get plausibility from some lattice sum, so they would uh, approximate infinite medium correctly. But that's a bad choice, as I will show. Or you actually integrate the green stands over this uh, element, which you can do for cubes, and but it becomes especially important for rectangular cuboids. So importantly, this implementation, well, both of them, but I advise you only to use this IGT. It's available in other recently, so you can go and try. And so, here is some results here shown the number of iterations versus the effective index of a small scatter. So here is real part and imaginary part. So the main uh, result here is that if you have cubic dipole this, well, both work more or less fine, at least for this uh, region. But if you go to rectangular dipoles, rectangular cuboid dipoles, then the point dipole interaction, which is called CLDR here, it just fails uh, more or less completely. But when you use IGT, it's more, almost as good as for cubic. So that's uh, become this IGT, as I mentioned, becomes very important in this particular case. And how to use these uh, rectangular cuboid dipoles? The idea is basically if you have some uh, plate or a needle where one of the sizes is much smaller than the wavelength. So here is shown. And then for cubical dipoles, you are uh, well, you have to use small dipoles because they should fit into these widths, like, for example, two dipoles into the widths. But if you can use rectangular dipole, then you can increase the lateral size and then have small number of dipoles. And for example, here, the example, if you increase the wavelengths, you can 
increase the uh, dipole lateral dimension even further and have like 100 times less number of dipoles for the same problem and more or less comparable accuracy. So that's a huge acceleration, again, more or less for free. So, and that's available with current codes. Uh, so let me talk about the open questions that we have uh, with the DDA. Uh, first of all, I showed you homogeneous sub substrate, but many people want like a film, for example, or multi-layered substrate, and that's not solved, although there is a recent code that appeared on GitHub by Patrick Chomer, uh, so I have not looked at it in details yet, but it uh, can make this simulation. But I think it uses two-dimensional FFT, so it will be, again, quite slow for large systems. Uh, then if you want complex beams, I showed you some examples already or pointed to them. But if you have these beams near a substrate, then you need uh, some efficient routines to actually reflect the beam itself. So for one point, it's trivial. But if you want to compute this beam for like every point inside your particle and you have like millions of these points, then you want some efficient implementation. So again, this kind of a technical issue that need to be solved. About absorbent host medium, uh, here again, the technically it's simple. You just change your wave vector in the code to a complex number. Uh, Alexander Maskalensky was talking about it yesterday. Uh, but if you think about how you should define your observables to make uh, physical sense, and then you want to compute them efficiently, uh, probably best with uh, some volume integrals over the particles, not some brute force integration over the far field, then these are still open question. Then from this, you can go to complex frequency and even compute in Kazimi forces, again, uh, then non-local permittivity using, for example, hydrodynamic model, some other methods like discrete sources method, I think recently is uh, capable of doing this, but it's completely not clear for me right now whether it would be easy or not for the DD. Then already I mentioned magnetic materials. If you go to radio frequency, for example, that's very important. Uh, some optimizations for very large particles are very desirable. Uh, so even biological particles, so generally for some atmospheric aerosols, probably some hybridization with geometrical optics, but that's again, not, not clear how to do it. And speaking about computational improvements, there are block iterative methods, uh, which uh, the idea is that you can compute more efficiently your, uh, you, so, you, you may solve your linear system more efficiently for a number of right hand sizes, like 100 at a time, uh, faster than you do it for a single one. Uh, and then again, you can't use regular pre standard precondition. Most of the standard preconditions uh, are cannot be used for the DDA because of this special symmetry of the matrix, but circle and preconditioners can be, and that's an open question whether this can be used efficiently. Uh, so to conclude, the, I, I hope I have shown you that the DDA is conceptually simple, general, and powerful method. Mature open sources codes exist, so just go and try it. It can be used for a wide variety of physical problems, even non-linear or quasi-classical ones, uh, and the number of these kind of applications and physical phenomena are increasing. Uh, if you use it, please... Uh, have caution with extreme effective indexes and with sphere-based benchmarks. Uh, always try to verify accuracy and methods for that exist, even using the DDA itself. If you don't know which code to try, well, I can advise other. And also we have a discussion group for all kind of DDA-related questions, not necessarily with other only. So if you are lost or have some interesting idea, you're welcome to just send an email there. And with that, I want to acknowledge uh, all the collaborators over the years, which I have for the DDA development, and especially all other users, which ask a lot of interesting questions, uh, which sometimes they even don't understand how interesting they are, those questions. And for the funding, well, recently we are funded by Russian Science Foundation. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maxim, for this uh, this presentation. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. So um, any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand if you have a question. Well, there, yeah, okay, we have one. Uh, and oh. it's coming from Alexei. Please go ahead, Alexei. Uh, hello, thank you, Maxim, for your review. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, a feature um, when you face some physical problems with different scales. 
And uh, as far as I know, uh, I think it was a code of uh, Polymeridis uh, who, implemented, who implemented this uh, skeleton decomposition and uh, tensor trade decomposition technique. So uh, do, do you think it, it would be important in, in this community to have such a tool? Uh, well, uh, surely, sure. I mean, uh, here, the, as I mentioned, so the main idea that the DDA is really a stupid method. So it's it's like a hammer, you know? So you have this symmetry and you have droplets, metrics, and then FFT acceleration, you can do huge systems. But if you want to tune something, use some like uh, variable grids or anything like that, you just can't do it. And other ways uh, like going for mathematics, this tensor decomposition or like fast multiple methods, there are a lot of different approaches. I think Ines Fanny was talking about uh, one similar way. So once you go this way, it's much more complicated, but you can potentially uh, improve and get much better performance for such systems. And in terms of uh, like multi-scale systems, I think the only thing you can do simply in the DDA is uh, like uh, do a simulation with small grid, uh, like uh, large uh, dipole size, so small number of dipoles, and then use uh, the obtained internal field as like initial guess for a larger simulation. But still, you will need this like huge discretization. But maybe it will be it will take a, a bit smaller number of iterations. So that's the only like easy way to do it in the DDA. Okay, thank you. I, I think they increase the size of matrices by several order of magnitudes uh, comparable as usual for me. Yeah, yeah. So definitely you yeah. should go with mathematical intensive way if, if you can do it or understand or at least find some code for that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you. We have a couple more questions. Let's take one more from Alex Namad Rowan. Uh, Nancy, you can ask maybe your question uh, for the sake of time after that on the chat. So, Alex, if you could ask your question. Thanks. Uh, so I see you mentioned neutrophils uh, in your presentation, Maxim. Um, so have you, do you have DDA calculations on neutrophils and do you have a measure of how the scattering changes with the number and the geometry of the nucleus segments? Uh, yeah, well, we, yes, I will show. Yeah, so basically this paper, we had this simulation, but uh, it, it's really hard. The problem here, you can compute anything, but you don't really... I mean, the number of parameters is so great that you can't really compare with, with the experiment. So we, uh, this paper, we did some comparison, but we have not really varied anything. And this paper, the only thing that we can do is for a simple uh, model like that. So you just change the number of granules and their size. And then we had extensive DDA simulations here, but also we did some theoretical analysis based on some approximation, which kind of explain the result that we got. So that's, I think, the closest that we have to, to what you ask. Okay, thanks. Yeah, again, uh, thank you. If you have more questions, please ask on the chat. Thank you, Maxim. And let's move on to the uh, next uh, presentation.